H1, he does. No, yeah, that's a that's a great question, Ronald. And and honestly, right now there there is there is no way because it's um, because this I mean the technology is still really new, um, and everyone that builds a model like does it everyone does it you know a little bit differently. So um, there's there's been studies out there that you know validate the results. I mean, so ultimately what you would want to do is you would run you would run your simulation and then compare what you got in the simulation compared to you know measurements of what uh, what's in the real person. Um, or even, you know, just the geometric things, right? And so you, you compare your geometry to what there is in the real person. And right now there's just not nearly enough of those things to, to get, you know, good metrics um, out there. And so I'd say it's, it's kind of a big, it's kind of a big weakness in the field right now because there's, there's just not enough validation for, for these models. Yeah. So even even the ones that you see on on the repository, like it's not like those have been vetted. So that's you know those are those are just models that someone just ended up creating. Uh, I mean uh, I mean someone checked it, of course, but you know everyone's checking it according to the same kind of guidelines. And so you know I would say even a lot of those models, because uh, I, I can tell you that a couple of my own models are on there, and those and um, those are when I was still learning the software. And so I can tell you for sure that you know those aren't probably as good as you know what I would make now. You know when I uh, Knowing having all the knowledge that I have. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm not going to grade you on something that I, I don't even know how to, how to really assess myself. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, a big part of this assignment is, uh, you know, 
uh, just because just because you know a lot of this class, I think you just don't really have a chance to really experience, you know, at, at other parts of the of our curriculum here. So, you know, and from from a lot of different reasons. So, like first, just like using medical data, um, you know, um, using research software to I think probably for a lot of you, this is your first time using research software um, and running CFD. So for, for a lot of you, this is your first time running CFD too. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm kind of approaching this class from the perspective of like you know. This is kind of a first. This is kind of like a first exposure for a lot of you guys to a lot of these different ideas. Like, you know, of course, we're building off things like fluid mechanics and things like that. But, you know, I want you guys to more get exposure to these to these things and not have to worry too much about being, you know, super accurate. Because um, honestly, you know, there's there's not a lot of criteria out there to really judge if you're super accurate or, or not. So, you know, what I'm hoping is that you know you guys kind of enjoy a lot of this class and. You build a lot of skills that you can transfer to, you know, whatever your next step is going to be, either in the biomedical field or, you know, maybe you're doing something with CFD. You know, hoping that this class gives you something to, you know, contribute in either of those areas. Yeah. One more two solution I'll probably post. Um, um, let's see, our, our, our exam is on um, Tuesday, I believe, right? So I'll I'll, uh, I'll post the I'll post the solutions um, Saturday morning, um, probably probably right after probably right after the due date. So I think the due date is is tomorrow at eleven fifty nine. So I'll post my solutions right after that, so you can use it to study for the exam over the weekend. All right, it's uh, 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing on this uh, fine um, Thursday evening? Good, Professor, how are you doing? Pretty good. Good, good. Yep, it's uh, um, week seven. So, you know, we're, uh, um, I think we're very closely, quickly approaching the halfway point of the semester. Spring break is coming up too. So we have two more weeks until spring break. Um, and so definitely uh, looking forward to that because yeah, it's, been, it's been kind of busy lately. Uh, okay, and so uh, today we're going to continue on our, with our lecture slides on cardiovascular diseases, right? Because uh, I know, you know, we just kind of did a really heavy unit on bump parameter modeling. And so, you know, uh, with the cardiovascular diseases, I'm hoping this is kind of a little bit of a cool down. So um, you'll hear me, you'll basically, you can hear me talk about, you know, cardiovascular diseases for, you know, a lecture and a half or, you know, however long, however long it takes. And so probably, you know, I don't know if we'll finish everything today, but, you know, whatever we don't finish, we'll, of course, you know, pick it up, you know, at a later time. Um, and so next Tuesday is our exam. And so, um, you know, hopefully you guys got the announcement today that I, I posted up our review video. 
And so definitely check out the review video because I, I think, um, you know, I've, I've been fielding a lot of questions about, you know, homework two, um, especially specifically, you know, how to get the equations. And so I do a couple more examples in that review video. And so, you know, definitely look, look check out the review video to help you prepare for the exam. But, you know, you can also check it out to help you with the homework as well. So I think it'll be kind of helpful for that. Okay. Uh, and then besides that, you know, I think I did just a quick overview of arterial biomechanics, which is the other big, um, big topic. Uh, and so that's up on YouTube. You know, I, I think I sent I sent it out in an email today. So uh, so definitely check it out. Um, uh, and if you can't if you can't access it or you lost the email, just uh, just let me know and I, I can send it to you. Okay. All right. And so uh, another announcement I want to make is um, is you know please uh, you know please make sure to to choose your your model for your final project soon. And so I, I think I just checked the uh, um, um, the Google Sheet. Um, I think maybe about a couple hours ago, and I think. Uh, only about like uh, 13, 14 people have shown, uh, have signed up so far. So please uh, make sure to choose your model, you know, soon, because uh, it, it's it's a lot of files and a lot of data to move, and and I would prefer to only do it, you know, once, um, you know, or only a few times. Right? Um, and so, you know, if, if you can do it by, uh, I so I, sometime tomorrow, I plan to start, you know, sending out the first batch of of, of image data. And so, if you can sign up by tomorrow, um, then you can have your image data before the weekend. If for some reason, you wanted to start working on it right before, <laughs> right before the exam. Um, but at least you know you'll you'll have it then. Okay, Professor, uh, how large is the image data for like every um, like how much is do you think it'll be? Because I know it'll vary for each like uh, case, right? Yeah. So for for each uh, for each case, because right now um, I have about 190 different image data on my computer, and the zip folder is about 90 gigs. So you can expect you know each each image set will be about somewhere between 500 megabytes to to a, gig, to a gigabyte of, of space. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, they're big, so they're 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 decently big files. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions before we uh, we start up for today? Let's get this out of the way. Okay. All right. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on with our um, lecture notes on cardiovascular diseases, right? And so this is the, the this is the uh, lecture notes that I've posted up. I don't know why it says medical imaging here. So it's, it's not about medical imaging, it's cardiovascular diseases. I think it's, this is, I use the same uh, PowerPoint template from the medical imaging lecture slide that I did before. So I think before, I think we just finished talking about hypertension. And so now we're gonna move on to the next cardiovascular disease, which is atherosclerosis, which is my least favorite word to say and my even less favorite word to, uh, um, to spell because I always spell this wrong. And so what is atherosclerosis? So probably, you know, you've probably seen an image like what you've seen on the right in, you know, a bunch of different media, you know, in, in the US. So you've probably seen it in like Cheerios commercials. You've probably seen it in like, you know, daytime television for like some random drug that they're trying to sell you, you know, during the commercial break or the price is right. You know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very common. And when people think of like cardiovascular disease, usually what people think of is, is something like this, right? And so they think of, you know, some kind of, you know, plaque that came from probably you know the hamburger that you ate the other day. That's going to be building up on your blood vessel walls, right? And so you know all these kinds of diseases is they're characterized as atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is kind of the, the scientific name for that, right? And this is basically characterized as you know a buildup of fatty deposits, which you know we often call plaque, onto the vessel wall, right? And so the dangers with atherosclerosis is that if you have you know enough plaque that builds up. What can happen is that, you know, you can see here that the, um, you know, the path or, you know, the cross-sectional area for the blood that goes through, it just really, really narrows. And in, some, and in the worst cases, what can happen is it can, can cause a complete blockage um, in, the, uh, in the blood vessel, which is obviously you know, really bad, especially if it happens in a key blood vessel. Okay? Um, another big danger for atherosclerosis that I think, you know, a lot of people don't realize is that these fatty deposits here are these, you know, um, places with all these fats and lipids this can actually rupture, right? And so you don't really see it here. And I, and I think, you know, this picture doesn't really do it justice, but usually, you know, usually you don't have just exposed plaque or exposed fat that's kind of built up in your body. Usually it's actually covered by a very thin layer of, of cells, right? And that's to basically prevent all that fat from like, you know, traveling in your bloodstream. Um, but if that thin layer of cells ends up rupturing, then you basically have this like globules of fat that's like, you know, going through your, um, your bloodstream. And that's really bad because that can lead to things like, you know, um, heart attacks and, and strokes, which you know, are, are catastrophic cardiovascular events. Okay? Um, and so atherosclerosis, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And so, you know, it usually progresses over a long period of time. And so, you know, it's some, you know, for a lot of cases, it even starts in early childhood. And, you know, over time, 
you know, with a, you know, with a certain diet and maybe lack of exercise, you know, something like this can happen. Right? And so treatment options are, you know, um, are, are plentiful actually. So there's lots of different, you know, um, you know, surgical options or, or, form, or, 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 you know, drug options available just because it, it tends to be a common condition for, for a lot of people. Okay. <clears throat> and so th let's talk a little bit about how, you know, atherosclerosis uh, progresses. Okay. And so, you know, um, when you first start out, um, you know, you start out with a healthy artery that looks like this essentially, right? And so you have a nice round lumen, right? And so lumen is the term that we typically use for, you know, the place where the blood flows. Right? Um, and so, you know, normally your lumen here is you know, nice and round and your blood can flow impeded. Okay? And so the first stage of, of, of atherosclerosis is, you know, you have some fat that kind of starts depositing into the, into the vessel wall, right? And that's kind of the term that they use, that the fat deposits into the vessel wall. And so you kind of see like little traces of fat that kind of deposit there, but it's not really causing, you know, too much of an issue. Okay. And then over time, you know, as this continues, you have more fat that gets deposited into the wall. And you can see, you know, it's, it's kind of forming this, um, you know, this pocket right here where all the fat and the plaque is starting to form. Okay. Um, but what I want you to notice here is that, you know, in the early stages of atherosclerosis, the lumen is actually you know, not affected at all, right? And so if you compare, you know, the amount of uh, white here, which is the lumen compared into, in stage A compared to stage C, you know, it's still approximately the same. And so, you know, in the early stages of atherosclerosis, you know, what, has, what happens is that the vessel wall kind of grows outward. And so it kind of grows in, in, in thickness, but, you know, the actual part where the blood flows is actually not really impacted um, at all, okay? And, you know, that's kind of, that kind of progresses here, um, you know, in this stage that they call early plaque. It's only until, you, it's only at the point when, you know, the, that the vessel can't grow out anymore, that additional plaque starts to go, you know, starts to impede actual blood flow. And so that's, this is when, you know, the, the fat kind of grows out so much that blood flow starts to be impeded. And then eventually what happens is that, you know, the separation in between the yellow here, which is, you know, the plaque and the actual blood, you know, starts to get smaller and smaller until you have this very thin cap um, you know, they call this a thin fibrous cap. And that's when you're really in danger of this thing, of this thing rupturing, okay? Uh, but, but, you know, the upshot that I want you guys to, uh, to see here is that, you know, um, in the early stages of, of plaque buildup, you know, your lumen um, or your blood flow is actually not really impeded because the, because the blood vessel does, tends to build out. Okay. okay. And so let's talk about kind of the, the biomechanics and the fluid mechanics of, of the situation, okay? And so kind of in a, in a most, um, you know, this is, I, I call this an ideal case, but usually, you know, having any kind of disease isn't ideal. Uh, but, you know, um, for kind of a simplified geometry, we can kind of assume that, you know, the plaque goes, grows outwardly from all walls evenly. And so you kind of end up with kind of a, a neck here, right? And so it almost looks like a, like a converging diverging nozzle that you would see in a, in a rocket ship. Um, but here, this is inside someone's body and it's probably gonna cause a, a heart attack at some point. All right, and so the, the technical term or the medical term for any time when you have a narrowing in your blood vessel, we call that a stenosis. And so that's a term you'll, you'll probably hear me use a lot because it, it kind of just, it's kind of just a part of my natural vocabulary nowadays. And so I, I try not to use it, you know, because it's, you know, um, I think most people don't even know what it means, but, um, you know, when you hear me say the word stenosis, I basically, um, I'm referring to any kind of a narrowing in a blood vessel, okay? And whenever you have a narrowing, you know, and, and you know, as we know from fluid mechanics, uh, but conservation of mass basically requires that the flow has to speed up in order to get through this narrowing, right? Because, you know, at all cross sections in this vessel right here, we have a, a constant amount of flow uh, where flow is equal to the area times the velocity. And if you have a narrowing in the, in the channel or you have, you know, the area goes down, then the velocity has to go up to, to compensate, okay? And so what you have, you know, basically, whenever you have, you know, atherosclerosis, you have uh, an acceleration of flow going through the neck, okay? And the location where the velocity actually reaches its maximum is a point called the vena contracta, right? And it actually, in, in, surprisingly, it actually doesn't occur within the neck, but actually occurs slightly past the neck. Right? And so that's why you kind of have it over here, right? And the reason it doesn't, it doesn't appear in the neck, because I think, you know, a lot of introductory fluids classes will tell you that, you know, you reach maximum velocity in the neck, um, but the reason it doesn't is, is mostly because of inertia effects, right? And so like we talk about inertia in like lump parameter modeling with the inductor, right? So anytime you want to do a change in flow or a change in velocity, 
you know, it's going to take a little bit of time because the blood has some mass and it has some inertia. And so that's why, you know, the, the vena contracta or the maximum velocity always occurs after that. Uh, and then after you kind of reach this vena contracta, then the flow is going to expand. And so it's, you can almost think of it as like an expanding nozzle. And then what you're going to have is a lot of flow recirculation off the back end right here. Okay. Um, and then what's interesting actually is, you know, um, because of, you know, this maximum velocity, because of these, you know, recirculation zones, you're going to have some very interesting um, profiles of wall shear stress, right? And so in the neck, around here, you're going to have, you know, very high wall shear stress because the flow has to accelerate to go through the neck. Right? But then after the neck in these recirculation zones, um, generally in these recirculation zones, the, the fluid velocity is, is relatively low. Um, you're going to have relatively low wall shear stress, right? So you're going to have two extremes where you have kind of high wall shear stress in the neck region and then low wall shear stress on the back end. Um, and that actually affects, that actually affects how the, uh, how the plaque actually progresses. Um, all right, uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so now let's talk about pressure. Um, and pressure is actually a really important part of you know, how we actually assess how bad um, plaque is, right? Uh, and so uh, in order to actually flow through this, um, this narrowing, um, the fluid pressure actually has to have a dramatic drop. And so, you know, if you kind of measure the if you kind of measure the pressure profile as you go through the, the gap, you'll have you start with kind of a high pressure upstream in the neck, and then as you go through the neck, the pressure has to drop. Okay, and this drop in pressure basically represents the large amount of energy loss that occurs, um, you know, as you go as you go through, right? uh, because you can almost think of it as like the flow has to kind of squeeze in through kind of a small place. And because of that, there's a lot of like, you know, um, form, form drag and also viscous friction drag, you know, that the flow has to overcome in order to make it through there. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, this pressure drop here or the amount, the amount that the pressure drops, this uh, basically tells you how severe the disease is, is going to be, right? Um, and so, um, you know, actually, you know, this is actually something that they use in, in the clinic as well, right? And so there's, there's, there's a, um, there's a clinical marker called fractional flow reserve. And so they call it FFR. And all that really, all that really is is just a ratio of the pressure um, before plaque and then after the plaque, right? And so the way they measure that is they actually take a catheter, right? So like we talked about, you know, catheters, they stick it up your butt and then, you know, they snake it around to wherever your, um, your disease is. And they use that catheter to actually measure, you know, what's the pressure before the disease and then what's the pressure after the disease, right? And then what they do is they just take a ratio of those pressures, right? Um, and so, you know, right now the clinical guideline is that, you know, if they do that measurement and your FFR is less than 0 0.8, or in other words, you have an 80, or you have a 20% pr pr pressure drop as you go through the, the stenosis, then that's, that's usually enough. Um, you know, that's usually what tells doctors that they need to operate because this is this, this, um, stenosis here is causing a problem. Okay. <laughs> You know, you don't want to sign up for it because because usually you know usually when that happens you're you're paying you know a few thousand dollars for some medical intern to stick a stick a probe up your butt which is uh, you know not fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so this so this is actually big because um, you know um, because actually you know because because of the fact that you know plaque tends to grow outwards. You know, a lot of times when you take like a CT scan of, of a person, like you can you can see like you can see that they have some plaque in their body, but you but you but you know just because you see in the image, you know it's hard to tell how much of an impact that's actually having on their on their actual blood flow, and so a lot of times you know um, if you're just looking at the CT, that ends up being just a uh, a false positive, um, because you know what ends up happening is that you it might look like a big disease, but what's happening is that the vessel wall is just growing is just growing outwards, and so in order to really determine you know, whether the doctor should, you know, perform surgery or, you know, to apply some kind of medical device, then they have to, you know, measure this FFR, um, FFR um, measurement here. Okay. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, as, as from the chat here, you know, it's, it's not fun to get a probe stuck up your butt, you know, just, just to see, you know, if, if, if you have to pay for, for open heart surgery. Um, you know, there's a company out there called HeartFlow. And so actually, you know, a lot of my really close colleagues are at HeartFlow. And, and what they do actually is they use a lot of the technology that we're going over in this class, like CFD simulations to determine this pressure drop. And so you can get this FFR measurement 
without sticking a probe up your up your butt, right? And so, you know, obviously that's that's very attractive for the patient because you know then you don't have to uh, go to the hospital for it, and you just have someone run a CFD simulation, right? And so, actually, you know, I'm 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 talking with a close friend of mine that works at Brickflow, and I'm I'm trying to get him to come do a guest lecture. Um, probably near the end of the semester to tell you, you know, the kind of work that he does at HeartFlow and, you know, how actually this, uh, this technology is being used in, in practice right now. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, so I see quite a few questions uh, in the chat. Right. All right, question from Ronald. So for choke flow, do we say the fl flow is subsonic? Yeah, so the flow here is almost always going to be subsonic. So I, I brought up the, the example of a, of, a, of a converging, diverging nodule. Um, but you're never going to reach um, supersonic flow in your in your blood because that would be that would be kind of crazy. So, you know, the the flow is always going to be subsonic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just the geometry kind of looks like that. And so, question from Michael. Um, and so, are, is FFR used in decision making? Yeah. So FFR is the primary metric that they use to determine um, because you know if if they see you know if a person's um, you know has some atherosclerosis, you know there's actually you know a decision that the doctor has to make about you know whether it's actually more risky to do the surgery or more risky to kind of leave that in. Because um, a lot of times, you know, you, you, like everyone kind of has some, some degree of plaque when inside their, inside their blood vessels, unless, you know, you've been living like a, like a Buddhist monk, you know, for your entire life, you know, you have some measure of plaque in there. But a lot of the plaque isn't actually impeding your blood flow. Um, and so actually, you know, if we go in and try to do surgery on everyone with plaque, you know, we're going to end up actually hurting a lot more people than we're actually helping. And so they actually use the FFR to basically say how harmful is this plaque actually for this person? Um, because if the FFR is less than 0 0.8, then that plaque is likely to cause a problem and they need to go in and, and operate on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the flow rate. Okay. Um, and I think that, you know, this part's really interesting too, because generally what you expect is that, you know, as you get more plaque into your, into your blood vessels, you know, it's going to start constricting, constricting flow. Oh, uh, question from Josh. So question is that don't catheters affect the pressure as well due to their displacement? No, yeah, that's an excellent question. And so, you know, whenever you insert a catheter into a blood vessel, like you're, you're disturbing the flow. And so that catheter is, is not like a tiny little thing. It's, it's, it's bulky and you, and you definitely feel that as it's, as it's going up your rectum, that's for sure. Uh, and so, you know, something like that is definitely gonna be disturbing the flow quite a bit. Um, and so a lot of the, a lot of the science in, in catheters is to, you know, how do we, you know, how do we predict, you know, the kinds of disturbances that this is going to be, and then they account, they, they basically account for that digitally in, in the pressures that they that they measure. Yeah, but it's a real concern, and so you can't just stick a you can't just stick a, a piezometer or a, a pressure probe at the end of a at the end of a catheter, um, and so you, you need to do a little bit of processing just you know make make some corrections based on the fact that the catheter is is affecting the flow as well. Yeah, and the doctors are they also train too so that they put the catheters in position to to have minimal minimal disturbance on the flow as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so the flow rate, right? And so this is kind of the reason why they have FFRs because, you know, even when you start to narrow the blood vessel, you know, the amount of flow actually doesn't change all that much, right? And so the way to kind of read this diagram here is that, you know, this, this point right here is kind of the healthiest blood vessel. <clears throat> and then as you start to get more disease and more plaque, you know, the blood vessel tends to narrow up. But it's not until you kind of reach this point where you have about 80%, 70, 80% stenosis, that's when the flow rate starts to go down. Right? And the reason for this is that, you know, your body can detect when you have a, uh, you know, a blood vessel that's narrowing, right? And so we talked a lot about this, you know, when we talked about mechanical transduction. Uh, and so if, you're, if your body can sense that, you know, hey, you know, an, an upstream vessel here is narrowing, what your body can do is that, you know, for the smaller vessels that are downstream, you can actually expand those, those guys and to kind of compensate for that. So you kind of maintain the same amount of, maintain the same amount of flow, right? And so the body is, you know, it, it's an amazing thing because it can, it can adjust for a lot of different things, you know, depending on the situation. It's just that, you know, oftentimes there's, there's a limit to how much your body can do, right? And so, you know, all the way up until this point, actually, you know, your body's actually going to be doing okay. Um, I mean, it's not a good place to be because, you know, uh, if you get worse than this, you're kind of in trouble. But it's only when you know people start getting into this range right here that's when doctors really think about you know starting to do surgery for these guys. And this point right here, where you know um, where doctors start to operate, is uh, called the critical stenosis. Okay, um, and so let's talk about how plaque actually initiates because uh, I think this this part is really interesting, right? 
um, because plaque doesn't just randomly form at, at different, at, you know, at random parts of your body. And so, you know, studies have kind of shown over a long period of time, you know, both, both experimental studies and also um, computational studies as well, that plaque tends to, um, you know, um, build up at kind of the same locations in your, um, in your, in, in your cardiovascular system, right? Um, and the reason for this is actually fluid mechanics, right? Um, and so, you know, here's kind of a diagram, here's kind of a, a diagram of, you know, of regions where plaque tends to build up. And so if you have like a bifurcation here, so you have, you know, blood flow coming in from the left and it's kind of splitting off and going, you know, top and bottom here, you know, basically, you know, what you'll have, and, and, you know, if you run your simulations, you'll see this too, is that you'll have these regions on kind of the outsides of bifurcation. These have some regions of, um, these are regions of low wall shear stress. So the viscous wall shear is relatively low here. Right? And so these areas correlate very highly with, you know, the areas where plaque tends to build up. Um, you know, and this is, this has kind of been shown by a lot of different studies. And so this is kind of another reason why wall shear stress is such an interesting quantity for, um, for cardiovascular simulations, because, you know, it can predict when, uh, when, when and where, you know, plaque is going to build up. Okay. And so, um, you know, areas where you have low wall shear stress, this is, this is interesting to look at is, you know, maybe potential danger areas where plaque is going to build up. Right? Another, another metric that, uh, that people have come up with is, <clears throat> Not only low wall shear stress, um, but they all we also but um, places where plaque tends to build up are places where the wall shear stress tends to oscillate. Right, and what I mean by that oscillate is in it's uh it's when the wall shear stress tends to change direction. Right, and so there's a metric for this as well. It's called the oscillatory shear index or OSI. Okay, um, and so OSI basically measures you know how often you know the the wall shear stress vector tends to you know go back and forth in a particular region. And so you can compute OSI from some vascular too. And so that's, that's another one of the standard outputs. Um, but in order to actually see it, you actually need to run a pulse of tile simulation or an unsteady one. And for your projects, you know, I'm, I'm only requiring you to do a steady simulation. But, you know, if you want to run an unsteady pulse of tile simulation, you can, you're definitely welcome to do that as well. Um, and I'll probably arrange maybe like, a, like an, outside, um, an outside workshop to do it. <clears throat> Let's see. Question. So I listened to a podcast where a military pilot was talking about how blood vessels pop after high D training. <clears throat> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think I've heard something kind of similar for that too. I think I think what's what's happening there is um, <clears throat> actually um, more related to cavitation. Uh, and so basically, uh, what can happen is that if you uh, basically accelerate your blood or accelerate any fluid to um, quickly enough, you know the pressure is going to drop. Pressure is going to drop, right? So basically, the faster fluid goes, you know, the, the more the pressure drops. And so, if you go through extremely high Gs, you know, your your blood, you know, your whole body, I mean, your whole body obviously is accelerating, but your blood is also accelerating quite a bit too. And if you accelerate it, you know, so much that your that your the pressure goes below atmospheric, then bubbles can actually start to form inside inside there. And so, I, I think I think this that's related to that, but I, I'd have to kind of check um, more to kind of make sure. But that that's kind of what it sounds like to me is is cavitation. I'd have to check to make sure, though, but I, that, that's kind of just my initial initial impression for that. All right, any questions on, on this so far? <clears throat> okay. All right, and so let's talk about uh, plaque growth and rupture because I think this is this is another really important part. Right? And so just like we said before, you know, uh, initially, you know, the plaque is going to grow outward to kind of kind of basically preserve the lumen as, as much as possible. Uh, but eventually, you know, in the later stages of atherosclerosis, if you don't do anything about it, um, the plaque will actually start to grow inward into the vessel. Okay? And so here's kind of a more realistic kind of uh, image of what plaque um, actually looks like. So plaque tends to only really build up on one side of the wall. And so you don't really see it build up on kind of both sides of the wall at the same time. Right? And so when you have kind of a bump right here, you kind of have, you know, two regions that we can look at. Right? And so the first region is kind of the up, 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 uh, upstream side. Where the blood is basically hitting hitting against this um, hitting against this um, this plaque in, in order to kind of go around this, okay? and so in this region, you know, you basically have a region of high wall shear stress, um, and in this region, you tend to have a uh, a thin cap, right? And so you can kind of see in this image right here where the dark gray is basically where all the fatty deposits are. There's only a very thin layer of kind of light gray right here that's kind of protecting it, right? And so where things tend to rupture is, to, is tend to be on the on the upstream side. 
Whereas on the downstream side, because we have this kind of recirculation zone, um, you have you tend to have low wall shear stress, and you tend that tends to have a, a thicker cap. Okay. Right. And of course, you know, just like we talked about before, if this if this cap ruptures and the and you know the fatty deposits start to spill out into your bloodstream, you know that's that's very very bad because that can trigger you know a lot of bad things that happen in your blood in your blood vessels. So things like um, it can trigger clotting from the platelets, um, and it can and sometimes cause complete blockages to key areas. And so that leads to like heart attacks and, and strokes. Okay, so let's talk treatments. And so treatments for atherosclerosis, there's there's a lot out there just because it's you know it's it's fairly common. So there's lots of different ways to, to kind of treat. Okay, um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of times it goes kind of unnoticed until it's kind of too late. And so because you know because your blood vessels have that compensatory mechanism where you know you don't really notice atherosclerosis until it's really bad, you know, most people aren't really getting medical scans just for the heck of it. Right? Uh, and so a lot of these treatments here are kind of for late stage, you know, atherosclerosis where they've kind of already, something's kind of already happened. So maybe, you know, um, there's a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, or, you know, or there's kind of severe chest pain. You know, that's, that's usually when, when these things come through. Right? Okay. And so if detected early enough, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's these, um, there's these options here. So the first option here is plaque removal. And so here they basically, you know, go into your blood vessels and kind of, you know, literally remove the, the plaque out. They kind of scrape it from your from your blood vessel walls, right? And so, um, you know, um, they can't do this for, for a lot of your blood vessels because it's it's kind of a very, it's a very invasive procedure and they can only do it where they can kind of effectively bypass. So where you see this most common is if you have um, atherosclerosis in your carotid arteries. So, so that goes to, you know, those are the vessels that kind of lead to your brain. So that's, you know, in your necks and, and stuff like that, okay? um, And so the term for this is called carotid endorectomy. All right, and so the second option, which I think is, is kind of most common for, for most people where, you know, if they're experiencing, you know, high chest, you know, chest pains or, or high blood pressure is, is drugs, basically, right? And so uh, basically drugs can be administered to basically affect um, things like your cardiac parameters um, to, to um, basically to mitigate the atherosclerosis and, you know, and to reduce the risk of rupture. Okay? Uh, another option is um, an, either angioplasty or stents, okay? And so, you know, if you're, if you're, if you happen to be, you know, in the catheter lab and you're using a catheter to measure your, your, um, to, you know, check your FFR, you know, if, if the disease is just kind of limited to just one place, what they can do is they can actually use that catheter to, um, to expand what's called a stent. Um, and so, you know, a lot of you guys um, did stents for your, for your first homework assignment. And a stent basically is like a wire mesh that they're going to deploy into your blood vessels and, and you can almost think of it as like an expandable balloon almost. And so they're going to expand the balloon and a stent's going to be there. And you can, and literally what they do is they, they basically smush the plaque kind of back, back into the blood vessel walls. And so that blood can kind of um, go through again. And so this, this is very common because a lot of times they have to use a cat, they have to use a catheter to kind of assess how bad your disease is anyway. Um, and if they can treat it right there, well, the stent is already up your, up your rectum, you know, they might as well, they might as well do that. Right because they're, they're, they're already in there anyway. Um, and so, you know, um, stents are basically used when, when the disease is, is kind of localized just to one area. And so if it's, if, you know, if you just have a lot of plaque in one area, then they, then they can use a stent there and it'll, it'll, it'll open, open it right up. Um, and the most severe cases, if you have kind of, you know, a really severe disease or you have disease in multiple different locations, uh, what they'll recommend is open heart bypass surgery. And so that's kind of the image that I'm showing you here on the right. And so in bypass surgery, what they're doing is that they're, they're going to take, you know, different blood vessels from other parts of your body and then use that to bypass blood downstream of your, your blockage, okay? Um, and so oftentimes, you know, this, this is the case, you know, when you have kind of, you know, two or three or four different blockages. And so they might do three or four, you know, bypass, right? And so, you know, these are the terms that you hear on like, you know, medical drama shows like triple bypass, quadruple bypass, right? And so all that means, you know, different, different blood vessels that are going... Um, and so, you know, I'll say practically, you'll never hear like a single bypass because if it's only just one disease, you know, they might as well just do it with a stent because, you know, open heart surgery is, is a big deal because they literally saw open your chest and they cut through your bone in order for, you to, for them to get there, right? And so if they're going to go through all that, you know, they better have a really good reason to do so. So bypass surgery is kind of the last option, you know, but for a lot of people, it's, it's necessary when they have, you know, really, really severe disease, okay? Uh, all right. So any questions on, on this so far?
Okay, so that's atherosclerosis. So, you know, we spend a good amount of time on that because it's, you know, it's, it's a big disease that affects a lot of people. And so now let's talk about aneurysms, okay? And so aneurysms, you know, just like I mentioned, you know, last time I think is one of the most abused words in, um, you know, in just general conversation, right? Um, and so you can't, just like I said last time, you can't form an aneurysm by getting angry at people, right? And so, you know, the whole anime thing where you get mad and your blood vessel that shows up, that's, that's not a real thing. So don't, so stop, stop doing that. And so the, the scientific term for an aneurysm is basically just a localized swelling of, blood, of a blood vessel um, that's larger than its original diameter, right? And so that's kind of what you see here in like um, the, um, in figures A and B. Um, and another type of aneurysm is some is basically a sack of blood that kind of forms on the outside. And so uh, what they call that is basically out, out pouching, okay? And these, and these types of geometries kind of, um, they characterize the two different forms, right? Or two different types. And so the first type that I talked about, which is just kind of a localized swelling or a localized increase, this is what's called a fusiform aneurysm. Okay, uh, and these are actually most common in your abdominal. And so we'll talk that a bit more later. And then the other type of aneurysm, which is this outpouching type, um, this is called saccular aneurysms because it's literally just like a sac that kind of forms on the outside. Okay, um, and these are called Berry aneurysms, and these are these are most common in your brain, you know, which which, which uh, you know we'll talk about in a bit. And so the primary risk for aneurysm, so by themselves, an aneurysm is, is not bad. So, you know, if you have just a little bit of a larger blood vessel, you know, and a, and a sac, you know, um, it doesn't really affect, you know, the, the delivery of blood. So the delivery system is, is not really impacted by aneurysm. So it's kind of the opposite of atherosclerosis, right? Uh, but the concern with aneurysms is that, you know, they either might rupture, you know, um, so basically what that means is that a, a tear will happen in your, in your vessel wall and then blood will start, you know, um, um, spilling out on your insides, which is you know, an extremely bad thing, uh, or they might throw on boats. And what they mean, and what that means is that blood might clot in the middle of these, and that you know, and that might cause you know a huge blockage in the rest of your in the rest of your body, right? Because compared to a normal blood vessel, like this is huge, and so you know your body might say like you know this is really abnormal, and it might it basically just panics and say you know um, this shouldn't happen, and then your platelets get activated, and the whole thing clots, and you know, then that's that's a really bad thing. Okay, all right. And so, um, you know, I, I, I will say that aneurysms compared to, um, compared to a lot of other cardiovascular diseases is still, you know, relatively, you know, very poorly understood. Um, and so, you know, compared to like atherosclerosis or hypertension, you know, there's still very little that we know about aneurysms. Um, and there's even a lot of arguments about, about how they form. Um, but, you know, at the very least, you know, they, um, doctors have been able to identify some um, risk factors. And so some risk factors include things like hereditary conditions. Uh, and so if you have something like Marfan syndrome um, or some environmental factors can, um, can put you at more at risk too. So things like high blood pressure um, or cigarette smoking as well. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. And so let's talk about the, the aneurysms that I think, you know, uh, people gen, this is, these are the kinds of aneurysms that people think about when they think of aneurysms and these are cerebral ones. And so these are the aneurysms that um, occur in your brain. Um, and so these are extremely common. And so, you know, kind of like what we mentioned last time, you know, about four to four to six adults over the age of 30 have a cerebral aneurysm, right? And so probably, you know, a couple people in this class um, have, uh, have a cerebral aneurysm in their brain and, you know, they might, they might not know it. Right? Uh, but, but thankfully, you know, most of these are harmless. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, for the small percentage that aren't, you know, these aneurysms can rupture and this leads to internal bleeding inside the brain, you know, which oftentimes basically leads to almost instantaneous death for a lot of people. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's really, really bad, right? And the, and the scary thing about this is that, you know, they're extremely asymptomatic. And so most people don't even realize they have it um, until it's kind of too late. Cause you know, you're not gonna go into your doctor and, you know, and order, you know, a just random brain scan. Cause just cause, you know, no one's gonna pay, you know, that much money just to catch something that there might only be like a small percentage of a chance that there is. There, right? Um, and the ones that do form, you know, they're, these are primarily of the saccular variety. And so these are going to be sacs that kind of form on the outside of your, of your blood vessel, right? I was chopping in my head as a kid, and this is giving me mad anxiety. So, so I, I, I don't think that, you know, um, any kind of physical trauma is a, is a risk factor for aneurysms, um, at least, at least not to my knowledge. And so, you know, if that's, if that's, if that's the case, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's a big, it's a big worry, um. But yeah, so but cerebral aneurysms, you know, they, a lot of people have really called this the silent killer. And so that's 
I know that's an overused name and that's used to, you know, some people use that to, to, uh, to define farts, but, you know, cerebral aneurysms is really one of those things where, you know, you, you literally have no idea to have it. And the fact and the chance that you're going to catch it um, or the chance that, you know, people you're going to scan it and catch it is extremely low because, you know, you're not going to get a, a brain scan um, and, you know, and getting a, a CT on your brain is, you know, several thousands of dollars. And so, you know, most people just aren't going to do it. Um, until it's too late, until it ruptures, and then you know, and then you know, if you have a stroke, and then you know, that's that's it. So it's it's scary. You know, I, I remember when I first learned about this, I was I didn't sleep for <laughs> for a while too, and so I, one of my projects in graduate school actually um, centered around cerebral aneurysms, and um, you know, even though we got great results from that from that project, it's uh, not something that I, I like to think about a lot because it's uh, it, it just kind of end up stressing you out. Oh, so what if you have like top tier PPO health insurance? Um, so usually with health insurance, I mean, health insurance is, is another big conversation that I don't want to get into. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the best system, but you know, for a lot of health insurance uh, co companies, you know, they're not going to pay for a scan unless, you know, unless there was like a, a, a legit medical reason. So if you're just getting a scan just for precautionary reasons, uh, right now we're not at that stage where, you know, where that's going to be okay with the insurance. Isn't, isn't that what Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones got in aneurysm? Yes, yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah, um, my uh, my fiance always reminds me of that whenever I talk about aneurysms that she <laughs> that she got that. Um, but yeah, I, I never watched Game of Thrones, so I I I, I'm, I always kind of forget about that. But yeah, that was one of the things. And I think she had she had successful treatment of it too, which is uh, which is which is great. Yeah, yeah, health insurance they're definitely worse than the textbook mafia. So yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, but at the risk of getting in trouble, I'm, I'm, I won't uh, comment anymore on that. Okay, and so uh, and so let's uh, let's talk about some of the food mechanics of cerebral aneurysms. Okay? Uh, and so um, you know because these are saccular aneurysms, you know they're not uh, what I call conduit vessels. And so what that means is that the fluid is going to enter your aneurysm from the same place that it's going to exit from. Right. And so it's basically going to come in and then exit from the same from the same location. And so what tends to happen here is that because, you know, not that much blood will go into your, into your saccular aneurysms, um, the velocities and the wall shear stresses in these tend to be very, very low, right? Uh, but sometimes what can happen is if, if you have a saccular aneurysm that kind of forms at a bifurcation, which is kind of common here, what can happen is that if you have, you can have a, a high velocity jet that goes into your aneurysm that kind of impinges onto the back wall. And it, at that small location there, then you end up having high velocity and high wall shear stress. Um, but most commonly, you know, you, you're going to have cases that look like this, where you have low velocity and low wall shear stress. Okay. Um, and so, you know, because of the, because the wall shear stress in these aneurysms are so abnormal compared to the, the blood vessel, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the leading theories try to, are basically trying to link, you know, these wall shear stresses, either high wall shear stress or low with the, with the risk of rupture. Um, and so, you know, and we kind of, I kind of mentioned this last time too, is that these, these tend to happen um, often, you know, in the cerebral aneurysm just because of, of the geometry. Right? It, it's because of the geometry and also the, um, the, the chemical structure of the vessel walls too. And so cerebral aneurysms have, a lot, have, you know, compared to other blood vessels, they have a lot less of this chemical called elastin, um, which is a, uh, if you kind of remember from kind of very early in the class, elastin was the chemical that kind of helps uh, the blood vessel kind of be, um, kind of be flexible. And so with less elastin, then it's kind of more, more prone to kind of these, these kinds of um, things happen. Okay. And so, you know, just like we said before, you know, the, uh, the main concern for these is rupture. Um, but, you know, how, how an aneurysm initiates and how it grows, you know, no one really knows because, you know, um, there hasn't really been any data for like, you know, taking a scan of someone, you know, every day and, and watching an aneurysm grow like that, just because, you know, no one really has the money for that. And so most of the times, you know, when people catch aneurysms, they're often in the very late stages. And so right now, any, any, any theories that we have about, you know, how aneurysms initiate and how they grow are just purely theoretical. Um, maybe not purely theoretical, but, you know, mostly theoretical, right? And so actually, you know, um, it's very interesting. So there, there's, um, you know, for the people that study these aneurysms, there's actually two camps. There's kind of two schools of thought. Um, and so, you know, if you thought Twilight was bad, you know, team, team Edward and team Jacob, like this is even worse, right? And so for aneurysms, there's team high wall shear stress where they think, um, you know, a high amount of wall shear stress is what causes aneurysms to form and grow. 
Um, but on the other side, there's team low wall shear stress, where they think low wall shear stress, um, you know, causes them to grow. And both of them have presented their arguments, and both of them have some evidence. Um, but you know, after reading through this in law, and this is something that's very hotly debated in the field right now. You know, I will tell you that neither side really has really compelling evidence to really prove their case. So it's kind of an ongoing debate. Um, and until you know we have better measurement techniques and better diagnostics, I think we're never really going to know for sure really on these things. That dude's going to be Batman. Uh, <laughs> oh, Grant, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think what they can both agree on is that you know um, no matter how uh, an aneurysm starts, you know it's going to rupture when the vessel wall is weak enough to not be able to sustain the cardiovascular pressure force and strength. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of the other scary thing about aneurysm is that, you know, we don't really know how they start and how they grow. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, hopefully that, uh, you know, the medical community will be able to answer, you know, in, in the coming years. Uh, and probably engineers will have a big help with this too, because, you know, uh, we can run simulations on these things and, you know, maybe that can help, uh, you know, let's put some, uh, put some risk factors on this. Okay, and so let's talk, let's talk treatments. Uh, and so, you know, one way, and so, and a lot of you guys talk about these things in your initial homeworks too, uh, but right now there are two main treatments for, for aneurysms, right? And so the first treatment is clipping. And so it's a literal physical clip. And so like literally think of a paper clip. And what they do is that they, they clip off your aneurysm to basically prevent any blood from entering that aneurysm anymore, right? And so they, you know, people actually walk around with like, you know, little bobby pins in, in their head. It's not the same as a bobby pin, but it's kind of the same, same idea. Um, and the idea is to, you know, if we cut off blood flow to these aneurysms, then even if they do rupture, then it doesn't, you know, no blood is going to leak out because we, because we basically cut it off. Right? And so that's, that's one way to, to treat it. Uh, another, another treatment option, which I think is becoming more popular is coiling. And so what that is, is that they basically insert, you know, a bunch of, you know, coils in here. And oftentimes they're coated with some kind of um, chemical and some kind of drug. And the idea is to do this, to encourage the blood just inside this aneurysm to clot. Because if this entire you know, aneurysm clots by itself, then what it essentially does is it kind of seals it off from the rest of the, um, from the, rest of the blood vessel, um, basically you know, avoiding any kind, of, uh, any kind of risk as well. Because right? then there's, if that blood clots and dries up, then you know, effectively there's a wall right there and, and we don't have to worry about it rupturing at all, okay? Um, and with coiling here, stents are also used to kind of help prevent, um, to, uh, to help isolate it further, right? Um, but you know, you know, e even though, you know, both of these options, you know, uh, when I first started them, they seem kind of cool. They're still in insanely risky. So you're, you're talking about, you know, um, surgery on, you know, the blood vessels in your brain, right? And so, you know, even, you know, just treating an aneurysm is, is an extreme risk. And so actually, you know, even if uh, a cerebral aneurysm is detected for some weird reason, right? So say you did CT on your, on your brain, you know, it's actually a real decision for the doctor to make. Say, like, do we leave this alone or do we actually treat it? And so, you know, a lot of times actually, you know, they might actually decide that it's, it's, you have a less chance of dying if we just leave it alone than if we, than compared to if we treat it. Right? And the primary determining factor right now is just the size of the aneurysm. So, you know, generally if the aneurysm is above a certain size, that's what, that's what tells the doctor that they need, they need to operate. All right, question. So I'm guessing since the, um, since they put the coil in the aneurysm at the size um, of one doesn't um, reduce after it gets big, Yes, yes, it's a, it's a perm, it's a, I believe it's a permanent thing. Um, and so, you know, once they, once they leave it in there, then it's, it's basically permanent. And then it, it doesn't, it, it basically freezes that in time. So it doesn't grow anymore. All right, question. Couldn't the clot debris be ejected downstream in the coiling? Yeah, so that's, that's a, uh, I imagine that's a, that's a really big concern too. Um, and, and, I, and I'll say that, you know, I haven't done enough reading on, on the, on the clot, on the coiling procedure to, uh, to know, you know what they do to prevent that. But I, but I, pres what I presume is that they, um, you know, that they either import a stent or something like that, or they, they have something in there to basically, um, you know, prevent that from, from happening. Because, yeah, obviously that, that's, that's definitely a big concern that, that I would have as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what they do to kind of prevent that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, any other questions on, on, uh, on aneurysm treatments? All right, and so that's a cerebral aneurysm. So that's kind of the one type that we can consider. And so the other type of aneurysms that are more common that's not often talked about are abdominal aortic aneurysms or triplets, right? So not the car insurance company, but, um, but you know, abdominal aortic aneurysms, right? And so these are, actually look pretty, 
um, pretty intense. And so what, and so, you know, we, you guys know the aorta, your aorta is kind of the biggest blood vessel in your body that kind of leads from your heart down to your, down to your hips, right? So that's kind of what we did our project on. And so, you know, what can happen is that these can kind of balloon out and grow really, really big. Right? And so these are typically of the, of the fusiform variety. And so these are kind of localized, um, you know, expansions um, that don't, um, that don't form a sac, okay? Uh, and just like um, and just like your know, your cerebral aneurysms, you know these are mostly asymptomatic, um, but you know if they rupture, they can lead to um, some really significant internal bleeding. Okay, right. And uh, and when detected, you know um, again, you know the tr the decision to, to whether to treat an aneurysm or not really depends on just the size. Okay. Um, and what's unique about triple A's is that they can cause the formation of what's called intraluminal thrombus. Um, which is, you know, this kind of weird, kind of complex fibrous material that kind of forms on the wall of an aneurysm. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and, you know, we're, people are still kind of studying exactly what this thing does. Um, but what they do know is that, you know, this intraluminal thrombus or this, you know, this fibrous material, it kind of robs the vessel wall of, you know, the oxygen and nutrients that it needs. And it kind of makes it uh, more susceptible to, to rupture. And so here's some, some pictures of that intraluminal thrombus. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of gross. Maybe I should have uh, I should have had a a, 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 um, a warning, right? <laughs> right. But uh, but this is kind of the weird kind of um, stuff that so it's it's like kind of like jelloey kind of, but it's 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 gross and it kind of robs the uh, the vessel wall of a lot of the stuff. And this is this is very common in triple A's. Uh, question: So do our blood vessels have pain receptors? So they they do have receptors. So they do sense forces. Um, and they, I think, I think there are some nerve endings, may, uh, maybe not on the endothelial cells, but I think in the vessel walls that there, there are some, there, there are some pain, there are some, you know, pain nerves there too. And so, you know, if, if your blood vessel ruptures, you definitely feel it. So you definitely feel like sharp pain, you know, and that kind of, you know, goes, goes throughout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. And so just like cerebral aneurysms, you know, your triple A's here, they can also initiate and they can grow and they can rupture. Uh, but just like triple A's, you know, this process is still very poorly understood, you know, mostly just due, just due to a lack of data. Right? Uh, and because, you know, collecting the data on these things is really challenging because these aneurysms don't, they don't form overnight. And so these form, you know, after several you know, weeks and months and so on and so forth. And so if you really want to get a good picture for how these things form, you know, you have to be constantly scanning a person over a long period of time, which is, you know, which is just not feasible in, in most cases. Right? Um, let's see. Um, and so just like in the cerebral aneurysms, you know, when you have rupture, this usually results from the vessel wall losing elastin or, you know, when it's weakened enough. Okay. Um, and some, and, you know, there's some potential causes for, for this lack of elastin. And so, um, some, some people think, um, you know, it's because of aging, right. Uh, and so, you know, as you age, you know, we talked about, you know, your blood vessels tend to get more stiff and, you know, the reason it gets more stiff is that the elastin in your, in your blood vessels tends to kind of die out and kind of decay. Right. Um, and also, you know, if you have abnormal levels of wall shear stress, this can, this can also cause your endothelial cells to be, um, you know, weakened um, and, and cause more, um, more risk for rupture as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, so any questions on, on this before we, uh, we start talking about uh, medical devices? Okay. All right, and so what we've covered so far is we've covered, you know, hypertension, we've covered atherosclerosis, and we covered aneurysms, right? Um, and so those are, you know, those are kind of the main categories of diseases. And so obviously, you know, there's there's literally thousands and thousands more out there, um, but you know, these are these are kind of the big ones, most common ones, and kind of the most um, impactful ones that um, that you know people tend to study a lot. And so those are the that's why I kind of want to cover these ones, you know, for us to to kind of look at. Okay, so let's talk about medical devices. So now that we've talked about all of these diseases, um, you know, let's talk about some of the devices that engineers have developed in order to treat these diseases. Okay, um, and so you know, uh, and so you know, I, I probably don't have to tell you this, but you know, treating cardiovascular diseases is you know a major health challenge around the world. Right, um, and you know, as we get better at treating and managing these diseases, you know, life expectancy tends to go up. Okay, um, but with that, you know. Um, you know, as we develop more devices, you know, people are just not going to stop getting sick. And so, you know, as life expectancy goes up, you know, there's just going to be a larger volume of old people, you know, who require treatments for, for these kinds of conditions. Okay. 
Um, and so typically, you know, when, when, you know, people have issues with their, with their cardiovascular system, you know, the first thing that doctors will prescribe to you is, is, is not going to be a medical device. And so, you know, that's, that's usually not the first thing is, you know, when a doctor's asked to say, Hey, let's, let's put, let's put something mechanical inside your blood vessels. That's, that's usually not the first thing. And so usually what doctors will, will try to do is they'll try a pharmacological approach, um, which is, you know, drugs and medicine. Right? Uh, and so like, you know, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are on medicines that, you know, that manage their cholesterol or that manage, you know, their blood pressure and things like that. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people are on these, these types of medicines to help them you know, manage their, their cardiovascular disease. Right? It's usually at a point when, you know, these medicines or, you know, um, also lifestyle changes. So, you know, doctors will tell you to exercise more or to eat better. Right. It's only when these are kind of unsuccessful or, you know, when they reach a point of no return, this is usually when medical devices come into play. And so a medical device, you know, you can, you can kind of think of it as, you know, um, these are kind of the things that, uh, um, that are used in kind of the most extreme circumstances. Okay. And so, you know, medical devices come in, you know, many, many different shapes and sizes, but for this class, you know, what will classify a medical device is any device that's implanted inside a person's body to either help them treat or to help them manage uh, cardiovascular disease. All right, so what types of medical devices are out there? So there's, there's tons of different medical devices. And so, um, you know, you guys did a really good job of, of researching this for your first homework assignment, right? Um, and basically, you know, for every type of, you know, abnormality or every type or almost every type of disease out there, you know, there's, there's a device out there to help kind of treat it, okay? Um, and so there's devices to help you with stenosis, with atherosclerosis. There's, design, there's devices to help with aneurysms. So we talked about the coils and the clips. Um, and so there's devices that help with, you know, um, you know, if you have what's called a dissection. And so if you have a partial tear of your, of your interior vessel wall, um, but it's not a total tear, so you don't have internal bleeding, that's called dissection. And so there's devices that help with that. Um, there's devices that help with valve disease. And so we'll talk about valve disease in a second. Um, there's design, devices that help with, you know, abnormal heartbeats or called arrhythmias. Okay? Or even for total heart failures, there's devices for that as well. And so there's tons and tons of devices out there, you know, but we'll, I'll kind of, you know, characterize them into two categories. And so one category is called the, what we'll call an active device. And so these are active because they normally require some kind of power source or some kind of energy source to operate. And so we'll cover two of those in this lecture. So we'll, uh, we'll cover pacemakers and VADs, which are ventricular assist devices. And then the other category are passive, passive devices. And so these are devices that, you know, that some, um, you know, that, that don't require any energy. So these will be like things like stents um, or artificial valves, okay? And so for this lecture, you know, we, we don't have, you know, that much time, uh, you know, and so, you know, my goal is just to cover some of the more common medical devices um, and discuss how they work and, and maybe some common issues. Um, but, you know, the world of medical devices is much, much bigger. And so I, I know a lot of people in this class have interest to work at like, like a biotech company like Edwards, and so, you know, Edwards is, is designing these kinds of medical devices or Medtronic, you know, um, every, every day. All right, any questions on this before we move on to um, our first type of medical device? Okay. All right, and so the first type of device that we'll look at is uh, vascular grafts. Okay. And so if you remember, you know, back when we were talking about atherosclerosis, um, you know, one of the common types of uh, treatments there was a bypass surgery, right? And in those, you know, you basically take a, another blood vessel and kind of route blood around your, your blockage, okay? And so um, I will say that most commonly um, right now, you know, um, the grafts that they use for that are, you know, come from that person's body. And so they'll, they'll literally take a blood vessel from another part of their body and then use that to, you know, to route blood to a different, a different part, right? And the reason they do that is, you know, because because that blood vessel was already inside your body, then there's a very low chance that your body will reject it. And so your body will say, okay, you know, this is part of me, you know, there's no reason to attack it, okay? Uh, but for not, for everyone, that's, that's not always an option because, you know, um, there's not very many blood vessels in your body that you can just rip out and you can still be okay. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times what, uh, what has to happen is that, um, you know, a patient has to get what's called an artificial vascular graft. And so, you know, that's, that's the first, the first kind of device that we're going to have here. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, um, there's a lot of research right now that's going into, you know, what are, what are some good materials to make synthetic grafts out of? Right? Uh, and so conceptually it's, it's, it's very simple. So it's basically just like a, like, like a, like a flexible tube. 
And so, you know, it's no different than like, you know, a rubber, a rubber tube that you can use for your hose, right? Um, and so the major challenges for this aren't really, aren't really structural, they aren't really fluid mechanics, um, you know, because it, it's not hard to build a tube that's flexible that can um, carry blood. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, people have figured that out a long time ago. The challenge with vascular grafts is actually in, in terms of uh, suitability, right? And so, um, and so the issue that could happen is that, you know, if you introduce kind of this synthetic material um, into the body, your body might, you know, sense the fact that, hey, you know, this, this, this blood vessel didn't come from here, you know, uh, you know, he didn't come from this neighborhood, and your, your body might actually, you know, reject it, right? And so what I mean by eject it is that, reject is that your body might actually start to attack it, and so your, your immune system might be triggered, and it might, you know, start to produce, you know, a bunch of cells to try to attack it. Um, or, you know, in the worst case that, you know, your platelets will be activated and you'll have a clot that forms inside, inside the graft, right? And so, and then if, if you, if your graft kind of clots up, then it kind of defeats the purpose of the graft because then no blood can kind of flow through that, right? And so the major challenge with vascular grafts is making it out of material, making it out of material that the body will accept, um, but still has all the same, you know, all the, all the same, you know, fluid mechanical and structural properties that, that it needs. And so I, I would say, you know, it's still a very active area of research right now where, um, you know, they haven't, they haven't made, um, you know, I'd say there's still a lot of room for improvements because, you know, the vast majority of bypass surgeries are not performed with, with synthetic grafts. Because um, you would think, you know, um, practically speaking, it would be really nice because, you know, because right now bypass surgery, it, it sometimes it takes a whole day because they have to, you know, first they have to open up your leg, take a blood vessel out of your leg, close up your leg, then they have to kind of, you know, treat that blood vessel, wait a couple hours, and then while they're doing that, open up your chest and then put the, the graft in there. And so it's, it's a long process. And a lot of times you're, you're limited to, you know, just however long the blood vessel is in your leg. And so if they can produce these in like a lab and like a factory, then the doctor can basically order, you know, exact length that they need, exact diameter that they need, and then, you know, without having to open up the leg. Um, and so there's a lot of potential here for, you know, um, for improvement. It's just that it's it's just been extremely challenging to to develop a graph that's kind of accepted across you know um, basically everyone um, anyone that can get a bypass surgery. Yeah. Uh, all right, any questions on on vascular graphs? Okay. All right, and so let's talk about stents. And so stents are um, you know a pretty common uh, medical device, and so you know a lot of people wrote for this. And so what a stent basically is is it, it's almost like a wire mesh tube. And so it's, it's usually deployed at the end of a catheter. And what it does, it, it basically goes in and it's almost like a, like you can almost think of it as like a Chinese finger trap. And so it goes in and then you can basically expand it out. And then once you expand it, it kind of holds that structure. Right? Um, and so it, a stent can be deployed for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, one reason that can be deployed is to uh, basically um, open up a, a, narr a narrowed artery. And so that's kind of what you see here in this image. And so, you know, in this yellow right here, you can see that that was plaque that used to be there. Uh, but what's happening is that, you know, a stent is being put in to basically kind of smush that plaque against the vessel wall so that to kind of open it up again, okay? Um, and so that's that's one reason. And so another reason to deploy a stent is to support a weakness in the vessel wall. And so, you know, if the vessel wall is kind of a weak in a certain area and, you know, a doctor might, it might be worried that it might rupture or something like that, then they might decide to deploy a stent there to, um, to kind of, you know, support that. All right, and so just like we talked about in the atherosclerosis section, this is very common to treat uh, single vessel stenosis where there's just, you know, a narrowing in just one blood vessel, okay? And this is deployed at the end of a catheter, okay? And so, you know, in order to deploy a stent, you know, they have to stick a catheter, you know, um, you know, either up your butt or up your leg, up to the place where, you know, it needs to be deployed, okay? And believe it or not, you know, even, even though, you know, I, even though, you know, we've, we've been kind of joking that, you know, catheters are just not fun to, you know, have something st stuck up your butt, you know, compared to open heart surgery where they have to saw your chest open, this is actually very minimally invasive, right? And so if you have something stuck up your butt, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be pleasant, but at least you can walk out of the hospital in the same day. But if you have open heart surgery where they have to, you know, saw open your chest cavity, you know, you're going to be laid up in the hospital for a few weeks while your bones kind of recover from that, from that trauma. And so, you know, if, if you can be treated with a stent, you know, that's, that's usually much more preferable than, than having open heart surgery, okay, right? And so there's, there's a wide variety of different patterns. And so there's, there's a lot of companies out there that make stents and they all kind of have their own patterns to it in different designs, you know, and they all use for something different, okay? 
Um, and another thing that stents are used um, that that they do to stents is that they often coat these with a certain kind of material with a certain kind of chemical uh, to basically avoid any kind of adverse reaction from from the body. Okay, and so what those are called those those are called um, drug eluding stents. Okay. Right. All right. Any questions on on stents? Um, so I had one point to share. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yep. So what was interesting um, is that they had found the behavior, they tracked the behaviors of um, uh, patients who had had their chest ripped, um, cracked open, uh -huh. and then have mul uh, multiple arteries worked on, as opposed to the outpatient procedure where they were going through the femoral artery. And if they went through the femoral artery, implanted a stent, and it was an outpatient procedure, mm -hmm. they wouldn't change their behavior. So they would have to eventually get their their, their likelihood that they would need something more drastic, as opposed to people who actually had to have their chest break open, they would change their behavior immediately. Oh, so it was okay. interesting. They're like, well, it's the same severity, but patients wouldn't get it sometimes for when they got the stent because they see. thought it was like an easy procedure. I see. I see. That's that's fascinating. So I get, yeah, there's that there's that psychological aspect where it's like, hey, you know, I can I can treat this in a day, so it's not that big a deal. And so they don't they don't really take it seriously, and then they don't they don't really change their lifestyle, and then they're they're back in the hospital, you know, a few months from then with the exact right. same issue because they don't they don't change right. their lifestyle. But yeah, if you're laid up in the hospital for a few weeks and it's like, man, that was a big deal. I don't want to do it that again, you know, then that that that's probably going to make you change your lifestyle. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, thanks thanks for sharing that. Uh, all right. So any other uh, questions or comments about uh, about stents? Okay. Oh, I have a video here. So actually, uh, um, oh, I don't have it here because it's a. Uh, I forgot. I made this a PowerPoint. Actually, let me bring this this up because I think you know once you see a video of a stent being deployed, then it's uh, you know then you can that you 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 kind of have an idea of how it uh, how it works. Stent deployment is this one. Start with this slide. Okay, and so this this is a video, you know, there's, uh, there's no sound, so you don't have to worry about it, but this video is basically going to show you how the stent is being deployed. So can, can you get, can everyone see my, uh, um, my presentation screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this video will basically show you how it's deployed in the coronary artery. Right? And so you have, you know, a, a pretty severe disease like this, and a catheter goes in, and you basically expand the balloon, and the stent, you know, literally smushes the uh, the plaque on the outside, and now you can have blood flow through that vessel again. Right? It's a very short video, but you know, it uh, it kind of illustrates um, basically how it how it works. Let's see. I think I also saw a catheter with a drill and capture mechanism to remove the blockage. Yeah, yeah, catheters actually, you know, we're, we're not going to talk about catheters all that much, but there, you know, there's a lot of things you can do on a, on a catheter. So, you know, we talked about, you know, measuring pressure with it, you know, we talked about deploying stents, but, you know, because the catheter is such a convenient device, because it's in the middle of the blood vessel, you know, there's a lot of research out there to say, you know, what other things can we put at the end of the catheter that would be useful for, you know, either research or for treating patients. And so um, I haven't heard about that one, but I'm, I'm, but that makes a lot of sense that they would have something like that where they can, you know, drill into a plaque and then remove some of the blockage from there too. So that, that's actually pretty clever. Okay, so let's talk about um, some complications with uh, with stents. <clears throat> All right, and so, um, you know, so the, uh, and so doctors, you're usually kind of worried about kind of these two things, right? And so the first thing that they're worried about is something called restenosis, okay, oops. And so in restenosis, um, basically, you know, you kind of saw in the video that, you know, the, the the catheter goes in and a balloon is kind of expanded to kind of push, push the plaque out, right? And so after you push the plaque out, you know, there's a chance that, you know, there might be some elastic recoil. Right? And so basically the blood vessel might, you know, it might basically, you might expand it. And then, you know, there might be such a strong kind of, um, you know, um, elastic response that it kind of crushes the stent back together again, right? Um, <clears throat> and so if that happens, then you're kind of back where you started from, the stent is kind of useless. Um, and so, you know, this can be mostly mitigated with the proper stent placement, um, because if you kind of deploy the stent kind of properly, then this, then, you know, this usually isn't an issue. But, you know, if your disease is, is kind of in a tricky location where it's kind of hard to get a good position, you know, this, this is kind of a real concern, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Ronald. Yeah, I, I couldn't be a surgeon at all. They they get they they make bank, but you know, I don't think you could pay me enough to to have to do all this stuff. Um, not only is it, you know, the gross factor is high, but just the amount of stress is, is crazy too, because you know, pe people's lives are literally in your hands. And so that's 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 a lot of pressure to, you know, um, you know, to go in there and and you know, someone's livelihood is how is independent, how well you can suture this this blood vessel. So that's that's way too much pressure for me. I get I get nervous enough, you know, um, you know, just talking in front of you guys. <laughs> uh, okay. And so the uh, the other complication that doctors worry about is injury to the vessel wall, right? And so as you can imagine, you know, if you go in with the balloon and you kind of rapidly expand it and you kind of smush all that plaque there, you know, that's kind of a violent, relatively violent process. And so what can happen sometimes is that you can actually cause some injury um, to the vessel wall. Um, and that can lead to, you know, a lot of other adverse effects too. So like the wall might, you know, inadvertently weaken and you might have, you know, um, you know, the, the wall might rupture um, or it might cause, you know, the platelets there to, to, um, to clot too. And so that's that's obviously a bad thing too, because you don't want to expand a blood vessel and just for it to clot, you know, and soon later. Right? And so this um, this kind of danger of, of clot forming after you deploy a stent is called neo-intimal hyperplasia or NH. Yeah. Um, again, you know, don't ask me why doctors choose such difficult names for all these things, because it, it makes it it makes it inc insanely difficult to remember. Um, you know, if you hear those kind of words, you know, you know, keep keep this presentation, keep this PowerPoint on hand, so that you know, if a doctor says this, then you kind of know what they're what they're talking about, because it's because uh, if, if you talk to a doctor, they can throw literally like the, the kitchen sink of you know medical terms, and you know, you're you're lost in kind of the alphabet soup of, of stuff. So, um, and so it's 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 hard to keep track of, even for me still. But you know, if you kind of you know, if as long as these words kind of trigger something, like, hey, you know, I heard that before in, in 442. You go back to these slides, and you know, hopefully, that kind of helps you remember what to, uh, what they're talking about. Okay, uh, and so there's there's a couple types of stents that, that are used, um, and so um, the first type of stents is called bare metal stents or BES, and so these are literally just you know some metal um, that they uh, that they use in, in the in the stenting procedure. So these metals, you know, obviously have to be flexible enough that they can expand, uh, but then they they also have to be strong enough that they don't kind of collapse on itself too. Right. And so the most common material that's used nowadays is um, basically a, a type of steel. And so it's 316L steel. Right? And so this, this material is chosen because they have you know, um, acceptable material properties. And so they're usually strong enough um, and they're corrosion resistant. And so they're, they're not gonna corrode you know, over time. Because usually with the stent, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna place it in a person's body. You know, it's gonna stay there for a really long time. Right? Um, and they have good biocompatibility too. And so, you know, your, your body is actually usually okay with steel inside your body. And so it's not gonna reject it and clot and do all that bad stuff. Um, with the bare metal stent, you know, um, the primary concern here is neo intimal hyperplasia. And so the, the concern is that, you know, you expand this so quickly that you injure the vessel wall, right? Okay? All right, but that's that's not that common nowadays. So that's only, that only is, is used maybe in 15, 20% of procedures. Um, but the most common um, stent that's used nowadays is called a drug eluding stent or DES. Okay? And so it's, it's you know, drug eluding stents are, these are stents that, that are coated in a certain kind of material um, that kind of, you know, helps um, inhibit clotting, inhibits all kind of the bad biological stuff that can happen. Um, and it also helps inhibit uh, neo-interval hyperplasia as well. Okay? Um, but, you know, these drugs can also have other adverse effects on the endothelial wall too. So you know, sometimes you solve one problem and you cause, um, you cause another one too. Okay. All right, question. So is a stent used to treat an aneurysm? So a stent can be used to help. And so actually, you know, I, I know that, you know, for, um, for cases where you deploy a clip or you deploy a, uh, um, a coil, sometimes a, a stent is also implanted into that vessel too to kind of help give it some structure. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes the concern is that if you apply a clip there, then that might cause some, some damage to the vessel wall. Uh, what you can do is you can deploy a stent into the and you're into that vessel as well to kind of help help it stabilize. So, yeah, stents are very versatile actually. So they they can be used for a lot of things, and so you know mostly we're uh, you know I'm talking about it being used for you know atherosclerosis, but it can absolutely help for an aneurysm as well. Yep. Uh, and so you know a, a really interesting area of research nowadays is is um, in, is into this idea of a fully resorbable stent. Uh, and so what that is, is basically a scent that will eventually kind of absorb itself into the body, right? And so this could be, you know, this obviously, this could be something that's very attractive because, 
you know, you can go in with a fully resorbable stent, use it to kind of smush some plaque and sort of kind of open up a blood vessel. Um, but, um, but just so that, you know, you don't have to worry about a piece of metal inside your body, these stents will kind of, you know, absorb itself into, into, your, into your body. Um, and so that's great because you know then you know once once the stents job is done then it kind of kind of gets rid of itself you know and then you don't have to worry about any of the long term consequences right and so it's kind of the same same idea as if you've ever gone to a doctor and gotten stitches right usually the 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 sutures that they use are you know there's some biological variety there um, and that's that's the one they use nowadays where they kind of kind of absorb itself into your body right because uh, I remember you know back you know back a long time ago you know they used use they just kind of use regular thread for that. And so you kind of had to go to the doctor twice. And so you had to go to the doctor once to get your stents done because you were running around with your little kid sister and you tripped and you hit the table on the, on the side of your head and your blood's going everywhere and your mom's, you know, panicking, right? And then you had to come back a few weeks later to get, this, to get, to get the stitches removed, right? But nowadays they use a special thread that kind of fully goes into your body so you don't have to kind of worry about that. And so, you know, um, fully resorbable stents is kind of the same logic. And so, you know, once the stent is done with this job, then you know, um, then it doesn't have to stay there for all of eternity. Then it can kind of just go away on its own. Uh, but it's definitely still a, a topic of, of of research, so it's definitely not something that's widely available on the market. Uh, all right. So, any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right. And so let's talk heart valves now. And so I think this will probably take us to the end of the lecture and then we'll cover the rest um, at another time, okay? Um, and so when I say heart valves, um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, you're born with heart valves. And so, you know, you don't have to get surgery just to get heart valves. Um, you know, and the primary place where you have heart valves is inside your heart. And so these are kind of the four heart valves that you, that you have in your, in your heart normally, okay? And what these heart valves are responsible for is that they're responsible to make sure that blood only flows in one direction, okay? Um, and what they consist of are set basically several flexible leaflets that can open and close. Okay? Um, but what can happen sometimes is that, you know, these valves can get diseased. And so they're just, you know, they're part of your cardiovascular system that can be, um, that can be diseased like anything else. Okay? And so there's basically two ways that valves can be, that valves can get diseased. Right? And so one, way, one, one form of valve disease, of disease is called stenotic valve disease. And this is what happens when your valve leaflets get too stiff. Right? And so if they, if, you know, if they're too stiff, what can happen is that they don't really open properly. So they're kind of like, and they don't really close properly either. And so this can kind of, you know, cause, you know, some, um, a lot of disturbances in your blood flow. So that's obviously a bad thing. Okay. Uh, another type of disease is regurgitant disease. And so what, and so what happens there is that, you know, something happened where your valve leaf is don't close properly. Right. Because ideally what should happen is that your valve should open and allow flow. And then when they need to close, they close and then they shut completely and they prevent flow from coming back. Okay? Um, but if you have regurgitant valve disease, what can happen is that these valves will start to leak. And so, you know, flow will kind of come backwards through your valves and go back into your heart. And so um, that's, that's, that's a bad thing because then that basically increases the amount of work that your, that your heart has to do. Because every time it pumps, because, you know, the, your, your heart kind of relies on the fact that every time it pumps, you know, all the blood kind of leaves your heart and goes to the rest of your body. But if you have a leaky valve, what can happen is that your heart can pump, and then some of the some of the blood will kind of leak back into the into the opposite chamber, and so your heart's kind of working with less you know less than one hundred percent efficiency, which is you know which is not a good thing. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and so if you have um, you know um, valve disease, you can fix this with an artificial heart valves, okay? Because valves are actually you know um, they're very difficult to kind of fix themselves. And so they're, they're lined with cells that don't really have a lot of the self repairing properties of, of the other parts in your body. And so oftentimes, you know, if you have an issue with your valve, you know, you have to go in and fix it. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you can replace this with, you know, either one or two types of valves. Okay. Uh, and so one type of valve here is called mechanical valves and see, these are basically made of mechanical parts. And so these are, you know, not too different from the valves that you might see in a piping system. Um, and another valve type is a biological valve, and these are often made from animal tissues, okay? Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, both of these are, are good, so, you know, one's not better than the others, um, but they have to kind of have these kinds of properties. And so um, if you have a replacement valve, they have to be durable because, you know, these valves kind of open and close basically every time your heart beats, and so they have to basically sustain 40 million cycles per year, right? Um, they have to be non-thrombogenic. And so basically they can't cause your blood to clot because obviously that would be a bad thing. 
Um, and they have to have a large orifice area. So they have to basically allow enough blood flow to go, to go through. Um, all right, and so uh, any final questions on, on this? Because we're, we're just officially out of time. <clears throat> okay, um, and so, uh, so that's, that's all we've got time for today. And so uh, we'll pick this up on next um, Thursday because Tuesday is the exam. Uh, so we'll pick this up again next Thursday um, and then we'll kind of finish up the rest of this, uh, this lecture, right? All right, so thank you guys for tuning in as usual. Um, you know, our next class period is gonna be the exam. Oh, for the exam, um, you know, you, uh, uh, if you want, you can come into the Zoom call and then you can ask me questions here, but, but it's not a requirement. So I'm, I'm not into the whole proctorial spy on you guys while you take the exam kind of thing, because I think that's kind of creepy. Um, but if you wanna come onto the Zoom call during the exam time and ask questions, you're definitely free to do so. Um, but if you would rather kind of just take it in, in the privacy of your own room, that's, that's fine too. And so the only thing that I ask is that, you know, you please don't talk to other people, um, you know, during the exam. But I'll, I'll send another email with more information about the exam too, okay? All right, so thank you guys for tuning in today. You know, have a good weekend. Uh, best of luck with your study. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Yep. What's up? Um, um how, can you uh, remind me how to this for the uh, ANSYS FBA class? Mm -hmm. Um, can I'm trying to open up my bike project, the the crank project again, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure how to open the like I have the folder, but I don't know which folder to open. Yeah. So the so the file to open actually is, is outside the folder. So outside, if you go one level up from the folder, um, there should be like an ANSYS project file. Um, that's that's basically the same name as your project, so it's like bike crank or whatever you call it. And so you want to you want to just double click that, um, and that'll open up your your project from before. So um, I'm going where the uh, file open, and then um, Thing is, my computer crashed and it. I, I saved it, but it crashed, and I think it saved it. On, it saves it on your desktop, right? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so I think that's the default place. Actually, actually, let me show you kind of uh, what what I'm kind of talking about. Let me show the screen again. Okay. So let me go to my. I actually saved this one on my desktop too. And so um, let's see. And so my project is called Test Ansys 2021. So I think this is actually from the first activity. And so this is the folder which has all the files. And so you don't want to open this one. And so there should be like an ANSYS um, um, project file right here. So it kind of has this kind of gray icon called Workbench. And it's a .wpg file. And if you double click this, this will open up um, ANSYS for you and it'll open up your project. Okay, and how would I see, because uh, the I'm not able to see like what I, the, uh, once the, what is it called, mechanical something? Oh, yeah, if you, uh, so the first thing you'll open is just Workbench. And so to open up ANSYS Mechanical, here, let me let mine boot up. And so to open up ANSYS Mechanical, you can, you can double click any of, of these guys. So usually I double click Model, and then this will start Mechanical. So it, it takes a bit to start up. And so, you know, um, what you can do is you can look on the bottom left of the screen here. And so it should say starting mechanical, but sometimes it takes a few minutes to start up. So just, just give it some time. Um, so mine, mine start up kind of quickly because I, I was actually looking at this earlier. Um, but yours might take a few minutes to kind of start up. But yeah, once you get to, once you get to Workbench, then you can double click um, model right here. Um, and that will, that will open up ANSYS Mechanical for you. Um, so it, it opens up, I tried that one. Um, and it opens up the part, but it doesn't. Uh, and so I, I went through the whole step of creating the, uh, the boundary conditions and the uh, sizing and the mesh and such. But mm -hmm. um, to you know when we we are when we actually cr uh, create the solution and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I I don't think it's saved then, huh? Because it, it all it's opening up is the actual part. Uh, 
the oh, okay uh, yeah pro the, probably probably didn't save then um and so yeah after after you apply all that stuff you need to go and manually save it in, in workbench recording before you close it because uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't save automatically when you, you do that stuff yeah. okay then I'll, I'll just redo it I, I got all the i answered all the questions uh for the homework i just need to put uh the report so the report is basically what the answer like the questions you basically asked us to respond to right professor exactly yeah mm -hmm. okay we use one like a like a very formal or um kind of what kind of like the like a lab report type of thing uh it, you can it can be informal so i think for for the activities you can you can just you know just answer it just um plainly and that's that's okay with me i mean the, the point of the answers activities is, is just is to just get you guys familiar with the software and so i'm not looking for anything kind of beyond that so i just want to make sure that you guys tried you know the things that i told you to try um, and then I, and then you just give me some evidence of that. So like screenshots and just answering simple questions. So, um, okay. yeah, so that's, 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 that's fine. Okay. Awesome. I had a question also. So for the, uh, element, the, uh, I think we're going to try, I think it's hex. Yeah. And I tried to hex and, uh, linear. Yeah. I think you want to let it said choose something different or something like that. I recall. Yeah, yeah, a couple a couple of people have been emailing about that too. So I think for uh, um, um, if, if and I'm not sure what causes to like actually like when I do this in the lab, now that I think about it, like what, when we're doing this on campus, there's just some random computers just won't let people do a hex mesh on, on this particular part. It's really weird. And so if the, if the hex mesh isn't working, then just just use tetrahedrons for it. Because it'll, it'll definitely work with tets. Um, yeah, it worked for both linear and quadratic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just so, just use tests. Um, yeah. For some reason, some computers just have the issue with the hex with the hex meshing, um, but and but only for this part for for some weird reason. So I, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, it's been a couple of years, and I still haven't really figured it out. But um, okay. but yeah, if the hex meshing isn't working, just just use the tests, and that's that's totally fine. Okay, professor. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the the homework for this class for uh for forty two. You're gonna have the solution up by Saturday morning, so we can review yes. it. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we up by Saturday morning, so you can you can you can look at it then. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you also say you emailed us a review video for the exam. Yes, yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure I sent that out. Let me double check just to make sure. Yeah. So the email is called review midterm review one posted, and then um, it has a link to the YouTube YouTube video from there. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Oh wait, this is for uh, heat transfer. No, sorry, not for finite element. Um, oh, I, I sent uh, I sent bo both. So yeah, there should be one for. I did the finite element one yesterday, and then the. Uh, oh, okay, I see it. I see it. I see it. Professor. Great, great. All right, thank you so much, Professor. Have yeah, a good day. No you too. Have a good night, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>